I am Viveka Minoti and I am a dropper. I am just exploring this world and trying to learn. I am a seeker. I come from a place called India, uh, which is the world's oldest, longest, most continuous surviving civilization. As you know, all the civilizations have ended. There are only two civilizations which have survived. One is Chinese and the second is Indian civilization. We call it Indian civilization because the world has become a very politically correct place. Actually, it's a Hindu civilization. And Hindu civilization includes everybody. In Hindu civilization, we have given birth to four world's most peaceful religions. Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and obviously Hinduism. So I come from a land where if you look at the Western world, when the West was exploring the geographical continents of the world, at that time, in that side of the world where I come from, the people were discovering the continents of their mind and their soul and their heart. When the West was discovering whether there is something else beyond my land, and when they were traveling all over the world to figure out that there are more continents, more geographies, at that time, we were discovering if there is something beyond life. If there is some power which is beyond our sight. And that's why you will find the whole, this world got divided into two different kinds of uh, ideologies and two different kinds of perspectives. One was more external and the second was more internal. And over a period of time, when we were discovering what is soul, what is the meaning of life, who we are, where do we come from, and we discovered that human beings have been gifted with something called will. Will. And that will can take you beyond what you see. And that is the reason that we champion what is called astronomy and spirituality. On the other side, the whole world was busy in wars and colonizing. And if you look at the strength of Hindu civilization, why it has survived? Chinese civilization, we don't know much because it's very close. We don't know what's happening there in the last 50, 100 years maybe. We don't know because we don't have access. But we are an open democratic society, anybody can come, see anything, whatever is happening, there is absolute rights. Yes, that is debatable, the quality of rights can be debated, but the rights are there that cannot be debated. Then, suddenly, some, some countries in the world decided to colonize other countries. Imagine you live peacefully, growing wheat and barn and milking the cows and looking at the sky and wondering that what's beyond the sky. And suddenly on the beach some ships come and people come with guns and you have never seen guns in your life. You don't know what it is. And they go boom, 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 from today we are going to rule you. So this poor guy stands on the beach and he looks at him and smiles. I said, okay, but I can't be ruled <laughs> because I am ruled by some divine force which we don't know about. How are you going to rule me? And I think that's where the entire conflict and chaos in India began. First, we were invaded. Uh, the Mughals, uh, people who don't know, Mughals came from uh, Iran, that side. And uh, for 800, almost 800 years, we were ruled by Mughals. That was Islamic invasion. And then we were ruled by Britain and also in small pockets by French people and Portuguese people. When the Mughals came to India, now it's been recognized all over the world, you can check in any... Uh, we had the highest GDP in the world. And that's the reason we came. Recently, I have, I am making a film on the second Prime Minister of India who died mysteriously in a USSR, dead USSR. And I was, I traveled to Samarkand. Samarkand is a place in Uzbekistan, which earlier was a part of uh, USSR. And while the lighting, they were setting up the lights, I was just walking, 
and behind some bushes there was old inscription in Urdu and Arabic, but roughly it meant something like this. Tamur Lang. Tamur Lang was the king. And he conquered most of the area, geographical area. And they wanted to crown him as the emperor. And he refused to take that crown. He said, I will call myself an emperor only when I have conquered the richest state in the world. And that state was Delhi Sultan, which is now known as New Delhi. So he formed a huge army and he came to India and what I read on the inscription was that in one night he killed 100,000 people. He burned all the houses. He destroyed all the temples. Temples are the place of worship for us. And then he traveled back and while going back he destroyed all the farms, all the villages, all the houses and they killed children, raped women and he destroyed the entire country. And that's how invasion started happening. He went back and he said, now I'm the emperor of the world. For 800 years we were ruled. All our places of worship, most of them were destroyed. We became one of the poorest countries. We had the world's biggest diamond called Kohinu. Now it rests with the Queen of England. Most of our statues, heritage, if you don't know, we are, we, uh, uh, the first text in the world was written, it's called Rig Veda, Rig Veda as it's called Vedas. The first language was created in India called Sanskrit. And all the scholars in the world agree that yes, it's indeed a God's own language. Because it's so perfect that it's beyond human comprehension that how somebody can write such a perfect book, a perfect language. Then, 800 years later, the British decided to uh, rule us. They came, colonized us. Now the Indian society, unlike most of the societies, never dependent on the state. In fact, there was no, no nation. There was no geographical boundary, you can say, this is India. There were more than 50 or 60, I don't know the exact figure, but yes, it was definitely more than 50, 60 states. And all of them had nothing to do with each other. Yet, we were a country, we were a nation. We were called India. And we spread up to Indonesia and up to Iran. So when British came to India and ruled us for almost 200, 250 years, the point I want to make here about the greatness of this civilization, we were always a family-oriented society. And not a family the way we see family. We believe in joint families. In one family, there is one earning member, or maybe two or three, including sons and uh, the cousins and all that. Some 20, 25 people live in one family. All your cousins, everybody, which is what you think is a family lives under one roof. I have grown up in a family, now all of them have come to US, and the number if you hear, you'll be shocked, 75. And nobody asks, my cousins, if I say he's my cousin, they get upset, they will break the relationship. So nobody knows, who is your cousin and who is your brother? Everybody is brother, everybody is sister. We never differentiated. And the neighbor is also your brother. In fact, in India, anybody who is from India would know that if you meet somebody in a train journey for two hours, that person becomes your uncle for life. <laughs> so when British came to India, it was called Sone Ki Chiriya which means a golden bird, a bird of gold. And they took that gold away and left the bird behind. One fact I want to bring about here, wherever the invasions took place or colonization took place, without exception, wherever the British people went, those societies became Christian societies. Wherever the Islamic invasion took place, those societies became Islamic countries. Indonesia, if you see, 
on the eastern side had no Islamic influence is the world's largest Islamic country. In Africa, wherever they went, wherever Portuguese people went, wherever Spanish people went, and they didn't rule them for so many years, they ruled them for 100 years, 150 years, 200 years maximum. India was ruled for more than 1,000 years. More than 1,000 years. But when, on the 15th of August 1947, we got the independence. Almost 80 to 90 percent of the population remained Hindu. They couldn't break the society. They couldn't convert the society, couldn't change the society. And that's where I think the inherent strength lies. The reason was because the families never cared about the state. Families had their own system. They had their own laws, their own constitution. And these families together, one family, then second group, and like that they made form the big community, and they had their own democratic process, which is called panchayat, which means the entire village. First in the family, you decide who is the head of the family. And that becomes the law, what he says is the law. Then all these families together would decide who is going to now rule the uh, village. And that guy, Sarpanch, he is called, and that guy became the constitution. So, in a very democratic setup, even now, today, in every single village in India, you have a family dispute, you have a land dispute, you have any kind of dispute, a boy and girl falling in love, and the parents don't want them to get married, you go there. And there are five people who sit there. It's called Sarpanch. Punch means five. They sit there, and whatever they decide is the final decision. Nobody can change that. Because it's called cooperative decision. So these were very well-connected societies. But slowly, with so many influences coming in, we had no money. When British people left us, India was a very, very poor country, extremely poor. And if you do not know, before leaving us, they also divided us. Because wherever British went, please do not misunderstand. I'm not here criticizing, I'm not against anybody, I'm not negative about it. This is history. And we, it's very important to understand that history. So when they left us, they also decided to divide us. India got divided into three different geographies. One Pakistan, East uh, Pakistan, and India. And that took many, many decades for India to break up. Because people think that, okay, these people, they were ruled, now we should. What the worst thing happened was that in these so many years of rule, we also became like that. It became our nature to impress them. And therefore you will find that the minds got colonized. And the colonizing of the mind is the worst thing which can happen to somebody else. Because then the thoughts are not yours. You are always dictated with a central thought how to impress the people who control your mind. And it's very easy. It's no rocket science. In real life, you see, if you are really, that he is fine. So he understood what I'm trying to say. And it became very important. And the leadership which took over, Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister of India, he actually came from a very royal family. He came from a family of landlords. His father has had a huge mansion. And he himself has said that his clothes used to, from India, for laundry, they used to go to Britain. They were so rich. And he became the first prime minister of India. And he was very influenced with the communist ideology of that time. It was very fashionable to be communist. And he introduced a lot of socialism to India. Where is a country which has just got freedom after so much of looting, looting, and so much of theft, and so much of crime against the innocent people? So many women raped, so many innocent children killed. You won't believe it when the trains used to come after partition, they were all loaded with dead bodies. From Pakistan, when trains came, there were no human beings, living human beings, there were only dead bodies. It was traumatic. It's impossible for anybody to even understand, comprehend, or have empathy for what India has gone through. We were left in lurch. Now, instead of building the country, 
I personally believe it should have been the job of all the freedom fighters to say, okay, our, our principal objective and job was to get you freedom. We have found the freedom for you. Now it's for you young people to run this country the way you want it. We declared we are a democracy, but we were never a democracy, at least for a few decades. I didn't know about this. I was like you. I believed in whatever the education system taught me. I believed in everything what the politicians told me and what was the popular narrative. And this is where I want to uh, change to another, uh, another aspect of this. If you look at it, this world, the entire history of humanity has been a war of narrative. Who is right? Who is better? Who is correct? And nobody knows the truth. Absolutely nobody in this world can claim, I know what is the supreme truth. But we have been fighting. War has been the biggest engagement of human beings. Because we want to establish superiority and nothing wrong in it because the strongest and the fastest semen, are the, the, that's, the, that's what uh, becomes a human being. India decided to go socialist way. I believe that was a mistake. Because the first thing, the communism, when we say socialism, again, it's a very politically uh, diluted word. Actually, the socialism was communism. And what it did was, it somewhere destroyed the enterprise of people. Everybody started thinking a society which never depended on the state a society which always was self-sustaining suddenly started depending on the state because the biggest problem with communism and socialism is that for everything you look up to the state. And when you start looking up to something for something, your enterprise goes down. And slowly all these young boys and girls started feeling defeated. When I grew up, there were only two brands of shoes. We have all grown up in scarcity. It's only in late 90s when the influence of socialism uh, got uh, diluted that the younger breed which started traveling and the IT revolution came and that's where I think Indians suddenly found their song. But before that anybody who has grown in 70s and 80s would know that on one side USSR and KGB colonized us you won't believe it that most of the politicians and most of the thinkers, most of the professors, the worst thing is most of the professors were on the payroll of KGB. And therefore we grew up hating success. And this is where I want to bring in a little element of uh, uh, my theory. I think if you want to understand and really want to seriously understand the social, social political evolution of a society, study the villains of their films. And I have done that. I have done it about Hollywood also, but this is not the right forum to talk about because that's a different theme. But it's, uh, you will understand what I'm trying to say. So very quickly I would like to tell you about Indian villains. Bollywood is the second largest film producing country in the world and the biggest soft power is Bollywood. Pre-independence in 40s, India got independence in 1947. Before that, if you look at the films, the villain used to be a landlord, who we call in India Zaminda. Zami means land. Anybody who owns the land is called Zaminda, landlord. What British people did, that they used landlords to run their machinery of exploitation. And Zaminda, this landlord would very often, uh, the poor farmers, when they need money, when I said there's joint family system, so anybody who gets married in the family is the responsibility of the head of the family to pay for it. And if he doesn't have money, he would go to the landlord and he would say, can I borrow some money? He said, okay, you can borrow and he'll give him the money, but in return, he'll mortgage his land. And he was so exploitative and oppressive that 
And because the poor guy, the farmer, didn't know any maths, he was not educated. He was a great farmer, but he was not educated. So he didn't know about anything about accounts. So all his life he kept paying the interest, never got his land back. So most of the movies, the villain was this oppressive, exploitative landlord. And then some farmer's son, a poor farmer's son, will somewhere get up and he'll say, now I have to take, I have to find justice. And he will fight him and ultimately he will win. A typical storyline. When India got independence, the entire system should have changed, but the new regime, which was led by the Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, the socialist uh, uh, leader, he said India should build big dams, we should have a lot of industries, but government would control who would run the industry. Government will give the permit and the license. The control was government's and the same landlord who used to live in village now came to cities and he became the mill owner. So therefore you'll find the movies of the 50s, the villain was the mill owner but his DNA was the same. He was still oppressive and exploited. And this time, a small, some labor son or a small teacher son, a middle class, common man. Common man, when I say, means somebody who's rooted in the culture and the ethos of the society. Again, that guy will stand up and he will fight what we call a war, fight of dharma. Dharma is following the purpose of your life should be the right thing. Whatever is right for you, that is your dharma. Dharma here does not mean religion, that's a different meaning. And then in the next decade, when Jawaharlal Nehru died and his daughter became the prime minister of this country, she more centralized the country. She centralized banks, all the banks were owned by, suddenly they were owned by government. They controlled the food distribution system and almost every single institution was controlled by them. And on the floor of the parliament, when somebody asked us, asked her, what about corruption? She said corruption cannot be stopped because it's a worldwide phenomena. And that day she legalized corruption. And that's why you will find that the same industrialist, now his sons and his uh, cousins and all those people, now they became, they started participating in the corruption and a small nexus got formed between politicians and this corrupt, oppressive person. And the villain, if you see, in the movies of 60s and 70s was somebody who was hoarding goods, somebody who was a trader, somebody who was a middleman. So from that landlord to mill owner, the industrialist, now it was the middleman. And then came 80s. That's the time, if you see, a lot of crime was taking in place. Italian mafia, Russian mafia, how can India escape that? So we also had our own small mafia because the government of that day won't allow goods to come in. So there was something called smuggling of goods. And these smugglers actually started dictating everything. They started lobbying and they started funding the politics. And they became the villain of our films. So if you look at all the films of 80s, you will find the villain is primarily the smuggler, the mafia guy. And again, this common man rooted in the society, in the culture, he would get up and he will fight for his dharma. In fact, one of the greatest superstars of the millennium is called Mr. Amitabh Bachchan. That was the era when Mr. Amitabh Bachchan ruled the film industry. And he, he brought in a new concept in our films called personal justice. So this guy would go, he will enter and he will shoot all these corrupt politicians with one gun. I think that was wrong, very wrong. But maybe, maybe the middle class common person coming from small town was so frustrated with this nexus and corruption, that he wanted to take that revenge. And then in 90s, India got liberalized. We found liberalization. And suddenly, 
the grim disappeared from our friends. And so did the common man. Because once again the entire narrative was taken over by uh, news channels and entertainment channels and the newspapers and the media because of liberalization, when we opened the doors to everybody, they took over. In India, the, 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 the domestic enterprise was not so strong that they could run big, huge media networks. And when the foreign media networks came in from everywhere, from no particular country, from the Middle East, from uh, the Far East, from Europe, and uh, I don't know if at that time we had any American channel, no Fox was there at that time. Fox had just come in to India. So, post liberalization, from the entire narrative, if you see, there was no common man. There was no news about any small town. If you are a small town middle class person who takes pride in the country and the culture, he was made to shut. He was told you are a regressive person. And that's where I think the problem began. And it's not just in India. You study Hollywood film, somebody should take it as a project. If somebody wants to take it as a project, I'm willing to mentor and sponsor it. It's very, it's going to be a fascinating study. If you see in Hollywood film, the mainstream, I'm obviously there are exceptional films. Who is the villain? The villain is a fantastical person. He is not rooted. Where is the common man in these big films? You have Superman movies, you have superhero movies. In real life, there are no superheroes. The superheroes are the people who contribute to humanity, people who have empathy, people who contribute to the growth and development of the society. But those people never feature. There are few films come, but they are small budget films, they win Oscars, but they don't go to China and Japan and India and all those places. So people think America is a country of superheroes and supervillains. Every child in this world today, wherever you go, is fascinated by these superheroes. We are again slowly you know, we are altering minds and the way we look at the world. So let's, let me, let me talk about Indian context. The point I'm trying to, yeah, and then post-liberalization, another thing happened, I think which has happened only in India, I don't think there's anywhere else in the world it happened. That one of the most important leader of the dynasty of Gandhi's died and his wife, who was an Italian woman, and she had nothing to do with India, she never even traveled outside uh, her house in India, somehow the dynasty, all the psychophants of the dynasty. See, the, when you have mediocre leaders, they want mediocre people around them. And they forced her to take the charge, and she shadow ran the government. Then, again in 2014, a major revolution took place, the government changed, and you will find the movies since then now again have villains which exploit women, which exploit minority, which exploit downtrodden, and again the common man is taking revenge. So since 2014, I would say it's a mini renaissance of India. The common man is back in the narrative. The point I'm trying to make here is that in this war of narratives, everybody is trying to shut up the common man, the common citizen, the common concerns. On one hand, either we try to portray as if the evils of the world are so huge and so big, people give up hope, they don't know how to fight them. Any issue for that matter, matter. minority issue, I know this world is going through a lot of churning because of globalization. A lot of countries, their own culture is getting unrooted and the foreign influences are coming and I think for next one decade, it's going to be like that. New technologies are coming because of social media, there's a lot of confusion. We don't know who's saying what. We are living in a world, what I call is dim lit world. The lighting is so dim that you don't know what is what in the room. Everything is blur. And that is not America's unique problem. It's happening everywhere. I travel 20, 25 days in a month and I travel every single day in a new city and I interact a lot with people all over the world and you, nobody should feel that it's, this problem is unique to India or problems are unique to US, it's a global problem. 
The global problem is that most of the population was born in analog age. People like me, we were all born in analog age. But your generation, most of you, are born in digital age. So we are trying to adapt to digital age. And there is a lot of confusion, you know. The speed, the pace, the way you look at the world, your perceptions, interpretations. And I think this churning is going to go on for quite some time. And here, I want to present the case of my country and my civilization. Ten years ago, when I was making this big, huge commercial feature films with big stars, which anybody would die for, somewhere I felt, as I turned 50, that I am that I am telling stories which people want to hear. I realized that I have stopped telling stories which I want to tell. So I resigned from Bollywood, from film industry, and I started teaching. There's an institute called Indian School of Business in Hyderabad, which is rated in top 10 business schools in the world. That's a very rich school and very rich students go there. So when I was teaching a module called I Am Buddha for Global Leadership, some students asked me to mentor them to make a documentary as a CSR project. CSR means Corporate Social Responsibility Project. So I said, how will you make it? Do you have money? They said, yes, we are going to put in our own money. I said, you are going to be the future CEOs of the world. And if you are going to put in your money, you have already failed your test. Go and raise some money. And within no time, within a week or 10 days, they raised money. But they didn't know how much to raise, so they raised a very small, of, small amount of money, which was not even one-fourth of my own fees. And here I was standing. I said, what to do? I encouraged these boys, and they've gone and got some money. But you can never make a movie out of this. So what do we do? And I said, maybe this is the purpose. This is the reason I quit. I must explore this. And how it happened, I believe in divine force. I don't know what happened, the universe conspired and somehow we made that movie. The theme of the movie which students had got was like this. That there's a corporate, a woman, a lady, empowered lady, who's a CEO of a big corporation who have mining interests in the jungles of India where the tribals live. If you do not know, this tribal area of India for the last 50 years is fighting a war with Maoists. Maoists are those people who believe in the ideology of Mao. Mao was the leader of China who killed over 60 million people. They have been fighting a war in India. And a big huge area at that time when I was making the film was approximately 40%. Now it's come down dramatically. But at that time, 40% of India was under some kind of insurgency. And these people were fighting this with guns, killing people, cutting their heads off, raping women, and killing small four-month-old children by hammering their heads and taking their intestines out and put, throwing them in bonfires and dancing and celebrating I'm sorry to uh, narrate this story because unless I say that, you won't understand the gravity of uh, their crime. For 50 years it was running because somewhere politicians were also part of it. That was the general narrative. So the story these boys brought was that this woman goes and there's a technical snag in her helicopter. She gets stuck there and she spends four or five days with these Naxalites, moist. See, uh, this war is called Naxal Movement. It's called Naxal Movement because it started in a small village called Naxal. But their ideology is Moist, so they are also called Maoists. So let me address them as Moists here, though my book is called Urban Naxal. The reason I call my book Urban Naxal is because if I call Urban Moist, a lot of people may believe they have some ideology behind that. But they, are, they have no ideology. So the general belief, so this woman gets stuck, and after four days, she starts believing 
that actually these people are good people. They are the messiahs of peace and they are working for the downtrodden. Again, this was the popular narrative. I would have made a mistake of telling the story which people wanted to hear. Because everybody likes Robin Hood. Somebody's villain is somebody's hero. Tamur Lang, the story I told you of Samarkand, is their god. They worship him like a hero. But for us, he killed 100,000 people. The same Osama was a hero in Saudi Arabia, was the villain here. The point I'm trying to make is this world, we don't know the truth. Your truth can be my lie, my lie can be your truth. But when I started doing research and I put the dots together, I realized that every single year, their cadre strength is going up. New people are getting recruited and joining them. And these are young boys and girls like you. Where are they coming from? I don't think anybody in anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, any parents can ever take, teach or condition the minds of their own children that, hey, when you go to college, you should pick up the gun and start killing people. It's impossible. Then what happens that they go to the university and within six months and one year, they become rebellions. If you look at Afghanistan, which is above India, and in Pakistan, these five, six, seven, eight-year-old boys, they become suicide bombers. How? Because the schools they go to, the madrasas they go to, some people keep brainwashing them. And slowly they get brainwashed and they start believing this is the best thing to do. Similarly, we figured out beyond any doubt that there is lots of professors who were working as recruiters. And as we explored this further, we realized that there's a huge nexus between the academia and the NGOs. NGOs means non-government, non-profit organizations. So if you look at India, on the eastern side, there are communist countries. We are one of the fastest growing, we are not one of the, we are the fastest growing economy in the world. We are the fifth largest economy in the world. We have left the people who colonized us, Britain, we have left them behind just a few months uh, ago. And in the next five years, as World Bank and uh, IMF and all the agencies of the world say, we'll be the, in top three economies of the world. Now, obviously, nobody likes it. We are democracy. We are an open country. We are a liberal country. Nobody likes that. So on the eastern side, we have communist countries. And they have a conglomeration of communist terror organizations. For 70 years, the northeastern part of India was under terror, uh, under, under the influence of, infested by terrorists. And on the western side of India, you have Afghanistan, Pakistan, and they have, they breed terror, terrorism there. So all the Islamic terror money was coming from the western side. And this money goes to create two kinds of chaos and conflict in India, one in Kashmir, and one in this red corridor. So I figured out, it's not that I figured out, all this data, information, research has always been there in public domain. It is still there, it was always there. It's not that I found something new. It's just I went there, put the dots together, and the first thing I asked myself, that for 50 years, more people get killed in Red Corridor in one year than the number of people who have been killed in 70 years in Kashmir. But why is it the entire world, including UNO, talks about Kashmir? And it's a very simple question. I want to ask every academician, every scholar, every media professional, every politician, including UNO in the world, what is the reason? That for 50 years, they, do, they have not let any, they don't let the government build roads. The minute you build roads, they blast it with IED. They destroy all the schools. And as we went further in, we found these Maoists extort to the tune of millions and millions of 
in dollar terms, millions and millions. How do they extort? In that area, because of the jungles and the forests, there is something called tendua leaves. So the leaves, it's, a, it's used for lots of things. So what mothers do, they collect fathers and mothers, they collect these leaves and they give it to small kids. And these kids put on their head and they could go to this weekly uh, market, weekly bazaar, and they sell it there. And it sells for, say, in a day, uh, about $10. In a and these moists take two to three dollars out of that from that little girl as extortion money. Whenever a truck passes through that area and thousands of trucks pass, they take about hundred dollars from them as extortion fees. And like that, they extort poor people. A doctor who goes to a village to treat a patient. They take money from their top. And they raise to the tune of millions. In Indian rupees, it's almost 1100 crore rupees. Now, in 50 years, nobody, not even one and you, Washington Post and New York Times, which always are writing about the fault lines of India, not even one asked this question. Not even UNO asked this question. No intellectual, no professor, nobody in this world asked this question. Yes, lots of people like me were asking, but nobody who had controlled the media and the narrative asked, where does this money go? And that's when we figured out with a bunch team of uh, researchers. And now everybody agrees on this. Few years ago, a professor who was on a wheelchair called assistant professor, assistant professor Sai Baba, he was arrested. From his house, they found a strategic document. And that strategic document says the objective. Objective is to take over the state of India. The state of India, not any party, not a government. By 2025, with armed revolution. Strategy. You just, how do you do it? Armed revolution, you just can't pick up guns and go to cities. By capturing the cities. How do you capture cities? By keep keeping them in constant chaos and conflict and create a civil war like situation because whenever there is a civil war, the citizens always support the revolutionaries, never the state. How will you achieve this? They said, <laughs> we have to capture certain groups. For example, labor. The minute you have labor under your influence, you can stop the motor of the city anytime. Intellectuals, policy makers, researchers, media professionals. And something which shook me up was, they say, if you capture the minds of students, you have got ready-made arms and ammunition always ready in the cities to blast it. And which is so true. Because students, they want change. They want to see a different kind of world. And it's very easy to tell people, create a narrative and influence. And that's why you will find very often in these protests all over the world, anywhere in the world. I was, in fact, shooting a film in London once, and there was a big protest. And lots of students were there. And I was asking some of them, what's happening? You won't believe it. Most of them didn't even know why they were there. They said, oh, it's for a cause. What's the cause? Why? Nobody knows. It's very easy to influence the masses if day and night, day and night, day and night, you keep passing on information. And therefore, we figured out, we, I made a film called Buddha in a Traffic Jam, which exposed this nexus of academia. And then for six years, my film was scanned. I had to struggle somehow to show it. Everybody abandoned me. My shows were cancelled and ultimately I went to a university which is basically a communist university. They attacked, they say they are the messiahs of poor people, they attacked the car, broke the car, that poor taxi driver's car and they physically assaulted me and broke my shoulder. After two years, after a lot of physiotherapy, I can't move my hand beyond this. If I do, it hurts. 
And that's why I stopped physiotherapy. I said it should keep hurting me so that it reminds me what is wrong with the world today. The problem is there are people who are anti-progress. And it's not India's problem. I'll come to that. There are people who are anti-progress. There are people who are anti-success. There are people who want to control everything. You call them communists, you call them anything, whatever you want to call them. They are known by different names, but they are the invisible enemies of humanity. They work like a mafia. In modern times, you can't see their faces. They can be corporations, they can be lobbyists, they can be anybody. And their only job is to keep disturbing countries, to keep disturbing societies, keep finding faults in society. And therefore, a certain kind of narrative got created about India in the world. I was in Purdue University recently giving a lecture. One of the students, his name is Akshay Jadu. He told me that some big uh, corporate people who were involved with the uh, invention of internet, I am forgetting the name, but they came, they were making a presentation, and they were, so students were asking them, and they were saying, uh, what's your plan for Japan, what's your plan for Korea, and what's your plan for Vietnam? And they were telling them what's their technological uh, plan. And when he asked what's your plan for India, that gentleman said, oh, India, we don't have a, uh, any plan because you have a major caste problem. You must have heard a lot of people who are from India or not, you would understand that very often it is said, but I want to here tell you something. When we got independence, the oppression of, of the lower caste by the upper caste, if it was at 100, which means the upper caste people oppressed the lower caste people and the index was 100. Today, you ask anybody, anybody who understands this, anybody knows about it? It's come down to almost 15 or 10, in that range, 10 to 15. This is the biggest and the most successful social re-engineering in the history of humanity. We are 1.25 billion people, it's no joke. But if you look at the narrative which is gets created, is that we have a caste issue. You must have heard a lot about uh, uh, the UN reports about Kashmir, human rights and stuff like that. That yes, in Kashmir, they kill a lot of innocent people. I shot a film there, I was there for six months. And all I see is these army jamans, the army people, they have to stand at every 100 meters. It can be 120 meters or something. One person stands there, one covers him up. And they stand, and Kashmir is in Himalayas. It's very tough weather, it's very tough conditions. They stand there throughout the day for 12 hours, the duty is for 12 hours. I have seen with my own eyes that a bunch of young boys and girls will come, boys will come, and they start stone pelting. They start throwing stones at them. Sometimes it hurts here, sometimes it hurts here. But the lobbyists, and the people who control the narrative sometimes say, what about the human rights of people? Now my question is, what, is the, what about the human rights of army professionals? What is the crime that they're to be hit by these people? And if you really go there, you'll find these five-year-old young boys. They are trained by their parents to throw stones. Instead of questioning that kind of mentality, people come and set up NGOs to find the fault lines in the society. And when we do that, the intention is to find fault lines and narrative gets created. But I just want to tell you where we stand today. Yes. Thank you. Today, India, we are the second largest food grain producers in the world. We have the largest English-speaking population. We have the largest IT uh, not second largest or maybe uh, the largest, I don't know exact figure. But in 2014, when the government changed, it's got nothing, I'm not, I don't care about parties, I don't care about political parties, but when the government changed, for the first time, the forgotten voices do not understand in American context, when I say forgotten voices in India, it means people who could not speak English. I'm talking about people who did not go to Oxford and Cambridge. 
I am talking about people who are not the beneficiaries of the corrupt governments. I am talking about people who basically took pride in the country and wanted to take it forward, but nobody heard them. So after the new government came in, in the last four years, the entire political map has changed. These young boys and girls suddenly have found voice. And they are taking this country to a new path. Four years ago, the tax, the tax paying uh, the, the population was hardly 2 to 3%. And today it's gone up dramatically. And it's not happening because some government is forcing anybody. Another thing, about women you must have heard. A lot of people say that in the eastern side of the world women are not empowered. That's a big uh, debate everywhere in the context of feminism. And before I end, I just want to end on that note so I can talk for hours. People say that women, why in your country women are not empowered? Now here I want to submit my argument. Indians have been traveling all over the world before anybody started traveling. We have been traveling for thousands of years. You have heard of Buddha. When Buddha traveled from India, the entire East became Buddhist. The most peaceful religion in the world. So we have been traveling. And wherever Indian people have gone, they have settled there for thousands of years. It's not just a story of last few decades. And there is no country and no city in the entire world where you won't find a big Indian community. A flourishing, rich, good Indian community. Nowhere in the world you will find anybody would say that Indians are involved in crime, they are terrorism, or they are against the society, or they are conflicting with the world, or they have wrong ethical practices. The general reputation of Indians you will find is they are good people. They are humble people. Yes, they shake their heads a lot. But, <laughs> but they are generally good people. If you meet them, they'll say, come to our house for dinner. They instantly create a relationship with you. Always helping people. Always sharing their wisdom, their knowledge. Helpful and compassionate. What else do you expect from the humanity? These are the best traits a human being can have. Who has been manufacturing them? When Elon Musk makes a battery-driven car, he's celebrated he's as the best innovator. His photo is on Time magazine, on the best magazines. And we must celebrate those people who create a product which changes the lives of people. But why have we forgotten that the first duty of a human being is to create good human beings? Who has been manufacturing these Indians who are never found, never ever found in any kind of conflict? Why is that India has the largest peacekeeping forces in the world? Why is that India has never ever invaded any other society and country? Why is it that you will never find Indian people picking up guns? No Indians. Indians don't keep guns. You ask them to keep guns, they won't. Who has been manufacturing them? Our mothers. So a woman who can manufacturers are wonderful human beings, you tell me whether she's empowered. So don't go by optics. Don't go by how we look like. Don't go by what you see in the city. We are not the explorers of the outer world. We are the explorers of the inner world. Our strength is spirituality. Spirituality is not shutting your eyes and doing meditation. Spirituality is about inner dialogue. What is outside and what is inside? How do we create a relationship between these two to discover supra-divine, a supernatural power, something which runs the entire world? Because we believe that is the ultimate truth. And what else is life except for finding the truth? That's why we are the only country in the entire world where our constitution, our motto is Satya Mev Jayate, which means truth always wins. There is no other civilization in the world which believes in that. Thank you very much.